You want to adapt Catcher in the Rye? I felt like I was reading about someone who understands me. Not Huck Finn, not Tom Sawyer, but Holden Caulfield. You have Salinger's permission? Dear Mr. Salinger, I'm one of 575 inmates here at Crampton Prep. A plague on both your houses! Salinger <laughs> can't help you now. You stole my goddamn letter! Why are you doing this? I like an adventure. I was wondering if you could tell us where Jerome David Salinger lives. Never heard of him, sorry. We're looking for Jerome David Salinger. We won't find him. Nobody does. I don't care about finding him anymore. There's just one bed. Yeah, I just thought that it would be cheaper. Jimmy, why didn't you tell me? Catcher in the Rye was created for the stage and people's minds. It mustn't be interpreted. It's all your words. If you do that play, you're stealing. guys thank you so much for Hello. being here and on a day like I, I just think it is so topically appropriate that we talk about J.D. Salinger one of our literary greats on a day when Bob Dylan wins the Nobel Prize I know that's pretty great that's pretty awesome right <laughs> so let's start with this fabulous director sir talk to me about the origin of the film well it's um, based on a true why story spots why don't you and I switch spots okay. so the there we go. That's just my OCD. I'm sorry, guys. So this is based on a true story. Um, all this happened to me. Uh, about 85% of it's uh, true up until they go on the road to find J.D. Salinger. And then from that point on, it's about 99% accurate. Um, and all my career, I've had a career in television, uh, directing movies for television and drama pilots and miniseries. People kept asking, when are you going to tell this movie? When are you going to make this movie? And... Um, I just finally decided now is the time. Why was it now? Like what made the time right? Well, I'd always wanted to do an independent feature, uh, but because my first job was in television, <clears throat> I just kept uh, getting job after job and it wasn't really time to, to you know, break off and take the time to develop this. And I don't know, um, Salinger died in 2010 um, and about 2012 I decided I'm gonna stop uh, the TV work and make this come true. What made Alex Wright to play you? Well, he's incredibly talented um, and Well, I had, I had to, what made me write is I auditioned about six times. Um, he made you audition six times? Yep, he actually, uh, exactly six times. So he always says, you know, Alex... It grows every one. time we tell the story. <laughs> no, it's six, I think it was uh, it's six, I think it was six, but... It's funny how he says now, you know, he was just the perfect guy, but he was not convinced till about my sixth audition. What was it about the sixth audition that convinced him? Um, I don't know. What was it, Jim? I think you just got tired. You're like, all right, let's just give it to him. We'll see what happens. Everyone loved Alex <clears throat> from the beginning, and um, I just, he just, I just wanted to see if he could take adjustments and do some things I need to have done uh, for the character. Yeah, and this was, I mean, this is, this, I'm in every single frame of basically this movie. It's, it's, it's a tough thing. So he had to see all the different kind of, um, you know, places I could go or whatever. So I don't blame him, <clears throat> but I do make fun of him. And, As you should. And they're, and they're not traditional auditions. Uh, the first one was uh, we got a tape, and then uh, we saw you in person. Maybe we Skyped once. So it's not like you're in the room with the person six times. Uh, we're only in the room together once. Okay. And then what about you, Stefania? Um, so I was going to high school in New Zealand at the time. So I put myself on tape and sent it in. And 
Jim saw the audition and my agents called me saying, um, they loved your audition. Um, we have a Skype call with Jim for you like tomorrow. So I Skyped Jim. He gave me um, adjustments to make for my callback and then I retaped, sent it in, and then like that weekend, I flew from New Zealand to Virginia, and it was pretty quick. So there were no six auditions. No. Nope, not for her. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing is I was determined to cast sixteen-year-olds to play sixteen-year-olds because I just don't believe it when nineteen or twenty or twenty-three or thirty-four-year-olds. Year right. Yeah. So, um, and they were great. They were great. Did, did you guys have a chemistry read? Because you guys have such a nice, lovely, natural connection on screen. I'm just wondering, did that come inherently to you? or did? Wow, did we never did. We didn't do a chemistry read. No, we didn't do a chemistry read. We just got read. lucky. We just yeah. kind of bonded up really quickly. We're, I mean, I'd say now we're still just best friends. We just had a mm -hmm. immediate connection. We kind of either had to be friends or enemies with this movie because we, we were in a car together. Yeah. You know, just us. The movie's really... That's what I love about it is it's so intimate and it's just two people most of the movie and that's some of my favorite movies are like that like Harold and Maude and certain movies and I and I found it kind of in that vein and so our we just had to bond up quickly. Yeah, yeah, we were just lucky too and also because we were filming in Virginia there's not a lot to there's do lot there to do, yeah. so we spent um, most of our time offset like together. So we really just became best friends and I think that just kind of read on screen, which was really good. But um, yeah, we just got lucky and, you know, we love each other. <laughs> well, it translates. What do you think it is about The Catcher in the Rye that resonates so much with people to this day? What? Oh, what? You jinxed it. I didn't sneeze. I'm good. Sorry, what was your question? What is it about The Catcher in the Rye that resonates so much with people to this day? Well, I think that Holden Caulfield is extremely relatable to anyone, and he kind of says out loud what everyone's thinking. So I think, um, yeah, I think that's why a lot of people relate to him. And it's just, it's real. It's it's what teenagers are feeling and it, there's no sugar coating. And so that's, I mean, that's why I like Holden Caulfield and that's why I think I relate to him. Yeah, and I think um, uh, Jim and I maybe love the book for different reasons, but I was, uh, you know, just obsessed. This book is my favorite book. It kind of like made me love reading. It kind of makes it a, a pleasurable experience rather than sort of oh I have to read it's just it flies by and it's it just really taps into exactly how you're feeling I think especially as, as like a young teenager who's lived in New York you know that's just perfect but what I loved about the script is I was I think I was a little worried when I saw the title that it was going to be some kind of imitation or some version of the story and I don't really think you can do that but with this movie it's really about just a boy who loves something so much that he kind of puts everything on the line and and uh, wants to find the author. And I, I just, I love this story. And Catch on the Rise sort of just an element or like a catalyst for this kid finding himself. And I think that's great that it doesn't try and imitate the book or anything. That's it's just so interesting to me because like obviously this, this was the book that changed your life and you guys love the book, and it just crosses all generational boundaries, which so little of literature manages to do. Yeah, um, <clears throat> baby boomers really love the movie. Uh, I mean, all ages do, but baby boomers particularly, because when the catch, when we read The Catcher in the Rye, it was a very, very different perspective. Nobody talked like that in a book that you were supposed to read. Um, um, nobody used that language, nobody had those experiences, those kids weren't going out drinking, uh, hiring prostitutes, um, wandering around New York City alone. So it really, <clears throat> it was something so fresh and daring to us, and that's not the case, obviously, when kids read it now. I disagree. I think it is still daring, still, still, like, still uh, risky. It still is somehow. Somehow it's got this edge to it still. The language, so I think. So many people have tried, but there's something about the way it's written that is so honest, just, like, how vulnerable he is and tough. And I think it's still, I think it's going to hold up forever. It's kind of like the Beatles of, of literature or something. It just forever will live on as the, the messiah of books. And something else that I think was really groundbreaking uh, that I've thought about lately, because it's, we've incorporated something like that in the movie, is that Holden Caulfield, he, it, he breaks the fourth wall. He'll be in the middle of a scene with uh, 
Sally Hayes uh, in front in the lobby of a theater, and then all of a sudden that scene freezes and he talks to the reader. And um, that wasn't something, you know, Shakespeare did it, but it wasn't something that we were reading in a lot of material back then, and that made it really kind of groundbreaking. Now it's done in a lot of shows and movies, but uh, um, that was also really fresh. It's funny, I was just thinking Deadpool, but that's obviously a very different, you know. Um, or Ferris Bueller. Yeah, well, Ferris Bueller, exactly. Or Annie Hall, or... Yeah, right. we could go on and on. Yeah, um, I think also what's uh, kind of brilliant about the movie is you'll see, not to give too much away, but you'll see that the first half, there's a lot of that, and then it completely drops off, and I think it was really masterful what Jim did is because he, he, he talks to the camera in the beginning of the movie as sort of, I think, an imitation of Holden. He's imitating him, he uses the same language, the same sort of, like, uh, same sort of bravado. But as the movie goes along, he becomes uh, kind of himself and finds himself, and he stops doing that. And I thought that was kind of cool. He stops breaking the fourth wall. He stops talking like him. He finds his own. And I think the movie is almost like also a journey of a person uh, stop the stopping of imitating something in art and just becoming yourself or something. I don't know. It's just so cool. I'm, I'm just so proud. I want you guys to see it. comes out tomorrow. Go and see it, please. You have been please. famous. You and your brother have been famous for a long time with the Naked Brothers Band and all the work that you've done since then. But this is a question for all of you. What do you think, uh, I guess, of the morality? Uh, is it okay to track down someone who doesn't want to be found? Like someone who's that famous but decides to take himself off the grid? No matter how much of a fan you are, is it, is it okay? Well, I think, you know, in defense of myself, <laughs> um, that wasn't such an issue in 69. Um, I mean, I of course much, it it's is. Much a big, it's a much bigger it's issue much, now. Yeah, yeah, we never, the word stalking, uh, you know, wasn't even in the vernacular. Um, so I, I, you could say that now, and I think, but still people up until Salinger passed away, they're still trying to find him, still trying to... Um, so I guess it's immoral now, or maybe not immoral, it's rude. How about no, that? And it's, it's not, I'm not in any way judging you. I was just thinking to myself, you know, they outed Ellen, or they uh, Dude, ends up outed Ellen. Dude, I think she's judging you. I think she's trying to start a brawl right now. Well, actually, and I, there actually is <laughs> a joking. line totally in the film where um, they actually discuss that very thing, uh, where... Um, do you feel guilty? TD says, do you feel guilty trying to find somebody who wants so much not to be found? I love that scene so And much. Jamie says, yeah, but... I've got this screenplay. I'm, I'm different. I mean, they did it with the, like, with the right intentions. And Jim, you went with the right intentions. It wasn't like he wanted to gain anything from him. It was a very um, innocent thing to do. And um, I think... Also, he wasn't just trying to get a picture with him or get yeah. his autograph. Imagine if he was like, hey, can we take a selfie? Yeah. I mean, he really? was just a yeah. big fan and wanted to... Yeah, for people you haven't seen the film, make so his basically... Book into a play. Basically, Jamie has adapted The Catcher in the Rye as a stage play, and he wants to play Holden Caulfield, and he wants Salinger's permission or approval or blessing, let's put it a blessing, uh, to do the play. So he actually, he wasn't there just to uh, you know, autograph, seek, or take a picture or something like that. What do you think would have happened if Salinger had said, yes, sure, I approve, I think it's awesome, go ahead? Well, um, pretty much the same thing that happened. <laughs> <laughs> you got to see it. Yeah, you got to see it. can't give too much away. Yeah. yeah. What did each of you take away from this experience? Because obviously this is such a personal experience for you. And you guys clearly loathe each other. So, <laughs> you know, that must have been very trying. Well, f well for me, it was just, um, it was completing a, a complete, made the complete circle. Um, this is, uh, in the beginning, um, they'll say that Jamie was a boy who... Uh, endured some bullying and ostracizing uh, in high school, in boarding school, and as did I. And that For doing has, the right um, thing, actually. Pardon me? For doing the right thing. Mm, perhaps, I mean, I, certainly I can see both points of view, uh, and you gotta watch the movie to yeah. understand what Give away what he about. did, but I, I personally think he did it for, out of the best intentions. Out of the best intentions, and um, so, that's something when you're ostracized like that and bullied like that for when at boarding school, you don't have a chance to go home and have your parents say, oh, we love you or your sister. You're there 24 um, seven, you know, and so it's relentless. And so that can have an effect. And I didn't realize till the whole film was completed. Uh, and then I went to a 45th reunion that I really had come full circle and the truest sentiment 
of the book for me at that point, at this point, was don't go telling, that's the last line in the book. I just mentioned this on the show this morning, yeah. Don't, don't go know. telling anybody anything, because if you do, you start missing everybody. And that's how I felt by the end of this whole thing. But it must have just warmed your heart when you saw the finished product, when you sat through the first screen. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. I'd seen it dozens or oh, hundreds of times on the computer, on the monitor, and all that. But to watch it on the big screen. With fact, an audience. When I went into that first screening, I said, I don't know how I'm going to watch this film one more time. I'm so sick of it. And as soon as it went up there, and Alex and Stefania are, you know, two stories high, and their audience is there laughing. I just fell in love with the movie. Literally, it was a love affair with a movie that I had worked with for two years and didn't realize how, how beautiful and profound I, you know, it affected me. And what about you two, Stefania and Alex? Well, as far as like the, seeing it on the big screen, um, I had a very different experience. I just was like, oh, I look horrible. I, and the same with me. The same with yeah, me. Yeah, I hate, I hate. both uh, cried when we no, first saw the No, seriously, I mean, movie. it's not like any, like, modest. It's really um, pretty, like, horrible to watch yourself on a huge screen. So that that's honestly tough. I can see for you how it's great, but for us it's kind of hard. It's a tough thing. But I, I've, grown to I've grown to love to watch it. But it, in the beginning it was pretty jarring to see that your face that big and you're like no way my nose is that big you know no way it's that but um uh you know it's it was like the most amazing experience doing this movie ever it was so great um and we had such a great time and it was you know very emotionally trying at times and it's you know it's a heavy movie but uh it's also was really fun and i think i'm just lucky to have done it with stefania and jim i just think it's really all because of these two, and Chris Cooper for being so nice and treating me like an equal, and he didn't act like an Oscar winner, which he is. You know, he just acted like we were in this together, and I think that made it easy because I had a lot on my shoulders for this, and I kind of needed her, and I needed Jim. But I think even especially Stefania, because that's a, that's a, uh, she was always there. She was always there in those scenes with me, and I think that that was really helpful. And you know what they say, if you can survive a road trip with anyone, you're, you're like bonded for life. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and for me, the same, like, it was just such an amazing experience because, I mean, Alex and I had such a good time, and we spent so much time on and off set together, so we just became really close, and Jim was amazing, and the whole crew was so good and really dedicated to their jobs, and it was just a really tight group of people, and um, so it was... It was kind of like, was, it was like yeah, you're going well, to a, a camp that you remember for the rest of your life because, there's, you know, I've done a lot of other things, but this is the one that has a real kind of like, it's, it's, it's emotional to watch and to talk about because it just, I mm -hmm. also feel like I learned how to act while doing it. Like, I learned how to really go there and I really learned how to, I mean, you're always learning, but this was just a huge learning experience. It really was. Yeah, it was very special. And so, um, and then once it, came out like the first time watching it it was it was really weird because you have all these memories and when you go like when I would go on set you're just kind of doing your own scenes and you know and Alex and I had fun but watching it as a film was like was insane because you you kind of don't the way that you saw it in your mind isn't the same as what's projected not at all yeah so um it was interesting and yeah the first time we both watched it we were like oh my god but the more we watch it it's easier, and um, now, I mean, I can see it as a film now. Me too. And last question for you before we go to the audience. What made Chris Cooper right to play Salinger? Well, he's just an incredibly talented actor, uh, a, a wonderful human being. I've worked with him once before, and he was right at the top of the list, um, and he just captured the essence of Salinger. I mean, if you go and you Google uh, Salinger, uh, he doesn't look like... Uh, J.D. Salinger, but most people don't know that, And but he became Salinger. And we actually showed this at a film festival about 30 minutes from where Salinger lives, the White River uh, Junction Independent Film Festival. And there were people there who knew Salinger, who's, who in the Q&A after the uh, festival, after the screening said, we came here to hate on this movie. And you got it. You got it. We love it. And actually... They got in touch with his widow and said she should see it, and so I picked the right guy. Yes, you can't get a better compliment than that, right? Right, exactly. And to our audience, please. Hey, uh, I'm a big fan of BoJack Horseman, who recently featured Salinger. That's my favorite show of it's all great. time, ever. It's I've seen good. all three seasons, every single episode. Just it's like on it. Netflix, everybody, you can see it. Um, they featured Salinger as a character in the show. 
I assume that's because he is now deceased and allowed. And I was wondering, like, what permissions did you have to get to make this movie? And as Salinger's maybe biggest fan, what do you look forward to being made uh, now that his works are maybe up for grabs for Hollywood? So that's a, that's an interesting question because clearly that was on the forefront of everybody's mind when we started out to do this. Are we going to get sued because Salinger is notoriously was notoriously litigious. Uh, in fact, uh, Field of Dreams, the James Earl Jones character in the book, Shoeless Joe Jackson, is actually J.D. Salinger. But when they made the movie, <laughs> they cast James Earl Jones and called him something else because they didn't want to get sued. So that was a big deal. And when you make a movie, you have to have something called E&O insurance, which uh, protects you again for many things. One of them is getting sued. And um, the original version of the script <clears throat> that we submitted, I had fictionalized some of the things that had happened between me and, and Salinger. And we were having trouble getting insurance. And uh, the lawyers and my wife and many people said, what? They've always been telling me, why don't you just tell the real story? Because we think that's more interesting. So I went to the real story. And then we were able to get that insurance. Because there's rights of free speech. Um, and I have the right to tell what happened. And I have a lot of documentation that, uh, that that's what happened between me and Salinger. So um, that's how we solved that. Next question, please. Hi, guys. Congrats on the movie. Um, are there any uh, actors, directors, films that have had a major influence on you and impact on you and your, and your work? Well, for me, um, I used to say when I was starting out that I liked Sydney films uh, because there were two directors, Sidney Pollack and Sidney Lumet, who uh, basically made character-based films, really strong character-based films with uh, usually good social, uh, good messages, and uh, those were the kind of films I was drawn to. Uh, the other director that I really loved was uh, David Lean, which is kind of the antithesis of that. I mean, he had good characters, but his was about the landscape and the great visuals, Bridge in the River Kwai, Lawrence of Arabia. Um, so those were my influences as, as directors. And Stefania and Alex? Well, I was, uh, um, uh, I think uh, De Niro on Taxi Driver is probably like my favorite performance of all time. So I think um, that's been a huge influence, sort of just moment to moment, I'll just go back to the drawing. Like if I ever need to just go and watch something, I'll watch that. And um, also, uh, All the President's Men. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of my favorite movies, but I think All the President's Men might have the best acting ever. And if you want to watch a movie with just two performances that are so in the moment and so responsive, it's it, it, it almost seems like you can't believe it's a movie. So uh, that, but The Graduate's a huge, I just saw this movie actually called James White. Um, and oh, that was amazing with Cynthia Nixon. Yeah, amazing. that's one of yeah. my favorite. And that is, and, and Chris Abbott's performance in that has become, I actually, I did a similar thing to he did. I wrote uh, Chris Abbott a letter and uh, f I found a way to get in touch with him and he wrote me back. So, uh, I mean, there's just performances all over the place. But that was a movie that came out a few years ago and it affected me near as much as, you know, The Graduate or, but, but obviously my favorites are, yeah, Taxi Driver, Graduate, Annie Hall, and um, those kind of great 70s movies. Midnight Cowboy, great, anyway. Um, and I mean, I have so many favorite movies, um, but what was really cool was during um, like the time that we were filming this, I had never seen The Graduate or Annie Hall, and so Alex got me to watch those two movies, and, um, and those, I, I loved them. I loved them so much. So I think that was very um, influential for me, and I really enjoyed those movies. And it's, I think it's um, helped me in, in terms of, I, I mean, the performances are amazing. The way they directed the movies were amazing. So, yeah, I think Annie Hall and The Graduate, but I could go on. I have so many favorite movies. So, Alex, you basically ran a summer camp film school. I love it. Yep. Yeah. Love it. Last question, please. Hi, um, I was wondering how easy or difficult it was to get into your characters considering the movie takes place in 1969. Um, yeah, I mean, the uh, you can, it was kind of easier because the when you walked on set, there were cars that were look 60s and your clothes were all 60s and um, and the music. I, I made a, a decision, a firm decision that I wasn't going to listen to any music except for 60s music. And so I think in that way, you kind of 
felt transformed when he walked on set. It was almost like there wasn't a big jump, and we wouldn't really use our phones, and that you know we tried to avoid that. But also, I think that that generation, I've been told um, by my parents that like uh, I seem like a '60s kid. Like I sort of have the same. I, I've just related to '60s and '70s movies and music, and that I've just gravitated towards that. So I think it was kind of like uh, I felt actually more comfortable. I felt like, okay, I'm in my right. This is where I'm sp actually supposed to be. Leaving it was hard. I, I have a harder time being in, like, 2016. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, because we were filming in Virginia, we were kind of removed from technology. And so... Um, totally, was, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. it was easier in that way. There weren't, yeah. like, movie theaters. So we literally, like, we didn't have anything. Like, we didn't watch TV. We, we just were basically Amish. For about yeah. <laughs> months. Um, so that was helpful, but um, in terms of also getting into character, just I think it helped that Alex and I just got along and we trusted each other and we were able to get to places um, because of that trust and I think that was extremely helpful. So it really depends on who you're working with and whether you feel comfortable with that person. Otherwise, it's a totally different story. And also, I just feel like the, the generational thing is actually the, was the least challenging part of clicking into the characters. Like that, I think that actually was probably the least troubling. I think getting into the characters had its own just troubling things. You know, it was a, it's a heavy story. But it did take someone from the '60s to actually keep an eye on things like, no, Alex, you need to pull up your pants. They didn't wear them that low. <laughs> things like details like that. And when can we see the movie? Uh, we open tomorrow at the Village East. Uh, at, uh, set, well, actually, it's open all day, but we're having a screening at 7.15 p.m. at the Village East. Uh, Alex, Stefania, and Chris Cooper and I will be there at a, for a Q&A. Uh, I and then, get full frontal naked in it. You guys can go see me get full frontal. <laughs> and then we open up in L.A. on the 21st of October and in Boston on the 28th of October. Congratulations. Thank you so Thank much you. for being here.